A group of skeptics are meeting in Toronto next month to question the events of 9-11. We've got to have an event on the 10th anniversary which will say, this isn't over, this is just beginning. This is just beginning. We have gathered here at Ryerson University in Toronto for the international hearings on the events of September 11th, 2001. Everything changed after 9-11. That is a cliché and perhaps a politically motivated one. However, governmental responses to that day's events have reshaped our world in ways uh, I can only summarize here in the briefest manner. The events of 9-11 have served as a cause or pretext for two major wars, producing incalculable suffering in Iraq and Afghanistan, and increasing instability throughout the Middle East. In Canada, let us add, there are parallel grounds for public debate and formal hearings. Two dozen Canadians were among the direct victims of the 9-11 attacks. Six times that number of Canadian soldiers have died in Afghanistan in the longest running of the 9-11 wars. And the kettling and mass arrests of more than a thousand peaceful demonstrators at last year's G20 protests in Toronto, while the police made no attempt to interfere with the actions of a disorderly minority, was one sign of the extent to which civil liberties have declined in post-9-11 Canada. The importance of 9-11 as a historic turning point, then, is not in doubt. But much of what happened on that day, in the period leading up to it, and in its immediate aftermath, remains in doubt, in terms most particularly of the agencies and causalities involved in that sequence of events. Our four-day hearings, then, will thus have a quasi-judicial structure. The presentations of the expert witnesses will be evidence-based, rather than speculative. The methodologies involved, whether those of the physical or the social sciences, will be rigorous. And the information that the witnesses present will receive a further critical sifting at the hands of the panelists, both in the questions they put to witnesses and also subsequently in their final report. Scientists have a distinct view of what happened because of their uh, professional backgrounds and so it's meaningful when you get scientists, architects, engineers, the entire conglomeration of the community that has looked at what we saw and studied it according to the scientific method. In general, the hearings are intended to bring attention to the most substantial evidence that has accumulated over the last 10 years, evidence that the 9-11 Commission report and the various reports issued by the National Institute of Standards and Technology failed to adequately address, which demonstrates that there is a need for a new, independent, and international investigations into the events of 9-11. The hearings are not a new investigation in themselves. The hearings will provide a succinct summary of the strongest evidence that a new investigation is immediately warranted and that the international community cannot abdicate this responsibility any longer. The format and conduct of the hearings will be analogous to, though not exactly the same as, a legal proceeding, a criminal proceeding that is known in the United States as a grand jury hearing. People that read this material and, and have looked into it realize the official account is, uh, can't withstand scrutiny. It's just full of holes and contradictions, gaps. Um, the difficulty is bringing this to the attention of responsible parties. The political class in the United States is, is basically, you can't talk about it, much less do anything about it. And so I think bringing it to Canada and bringing everybody together and trying to put on the table a, a collection of, of evidence that we are confident about uh, can raise the profile of this issue uh, because I, that's all we have to do is get people to take a look at it. So I've been interviewed a lot, especially recently in connection with the hearings, and the media have been told, I suppose, for 10 years that conspiracy theory is the term to use and that's why we don't interview these people much, and that's how we're going to disparage them when we do interview them. Uh, it hasn't worked very well for them recently. Um, 
because if that's what you've done for 10 years, instead of looking into it, instead of thinking about it, the most you've been able to come up with is the term conspiracy theory, then when you're finally confronted with a whole bunch of articulate, intelligent people together, and they, they just dismiss that as BS. What do you mean conspiracy theory? Let's talk about it. Then it turns out you don't know anything. You don't have anything else to say. So one interviewer after another, I find, has been speechless once you explain that the conspiracy theory label is useless. They have nothing else to say. Conspiracy theory is a, is a way of trying to discredit um, inquiry. I mean, it's perfectly legitimate to say, here is a very, very serious event that occurred. It killed thousands of people right off the bat. It's killing firefighters still today. It's used to justify war. It's killed thousands of American soldiers. It's killed millions of Iraqis and Afghanis. It's literally in the millions. And to consider that investigating the roots of that is somehow not legitimate, or that you have to be somehow psychologically impaired, some sort of conspiratorial thinking. They're trying to psychologize all this to where people can dismiss uh, people who even ask these questions. I think it's being a responsible citizen to ask questions of your government and to not just take what they say without any kind of critical thought. They have at least two officers inside the U.S. government to deal with conspiracy theorists. They, this is, this is uh, Orwellian thought control. The government is uh, in the business of telling people uh, not to listen to conspiracy theorists. They, we are bringing up legitimate questions that just cannot or have not been answered. We're putting our reputations on the line, speaking publicly about an unpopular subject. And all we're asking is that we be taken seriously and that the evidence be looked at. We should be a movement to rebuild trust through real inquiry. To bring about a rebirth of democracy and trust in the United States, this must be done in and by the people and, and some part of the state together. I look forward to the day that there can be a real legitimate transparent, independent court review of the information that is being put forward at this tribunal and the work of others who have done the necessary investigations. I think the alternate media, the internet, is an absolute critical part of this whole thing. I mean the news shows are a farce. Don't get your news from TV. We frankly uh, do, it appears, need to build a new media. That's, that's critically important for the future. If that happens, uh, I think that we're going to make a lot of progress in the future. Thank you for continuing on the path to seeking the truth on this 10th anniversary of 9-11 and for inviting me to speak to you. My name is Lori Van Auken. On September 11th, 2001, my husband Kenneth went to work at Cantor Fitzgerald in the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Ken was on the 105th floor of Tower One when American Airlines Flight 11 hit his building. He left a message that began with I love you and went on to let me know that he had felt the building get hit by something. Ken didn't know if he would get out. Essentially, he was calling to say goodbye. I knew that my husband had survived the initial strike, but that's all I knew. While I sat in utter shock from what I was watching on television, I continued to hope for a glimpse of Ken somewhere in the chaos of people running and jumping from buildings. At some point, President Bush was shown sitting in an elementary school class listening to a story about a pet goat. This footage was in a split screen with a video of the World Trade Center that had smoke billowing from a plane-shaped hole. I clearly remember trying to will Mr. Bush to get up and do something. But even after Andrew Card whispered something in his ear, he just continued to sit there. That was my first clue that something was not quite right. Shouldn't the Commander-in-Chief have a more important job to do while planes are crashing into the World Trade Center than listening to an elementary school class reading lesson? Wasn't the President of the United States himself a potential terrorist target? I thought of my own kids and worried that the children in that Florida school were in harm's way if President Bush was a target. As the final language for a bill that would give us the 9-11 Commission was almost agreed upon, we began to notice a lot of foot dragging. 
Vice President Dick Cheney had clearly been against having an inquiry from the start and was working behind the scenes to keep things from moving forward. Cheney was often seen on TV with some scary reason for why we couldn't have an investigation into 9-11. We wanted two years for the investigation, but got only 18 months. Initially, only $3 million was allotted compared, to with, compared with $50 million allotted to investigating the Challenger explosion. The commission legislation also gave guidance as to who would appoint the 9-11 commissioners. As per the legislation, President Bush got to choose who would head the commission. His first choice was Henry Kissinger. This news was getting some very negative press. Since Kissinger was informally known as the king of cover-ups, and we had fought long and hard for the creation of an independent investigation into the events of 9-11, this was unacceptable to most of us. Since Kissinger was tapped to head our commission, the Family Steering Committee asked to meet with him in his New York City office. A lot of research was done in preparation for that meeting, and we had learned that Kissinger and Associates had some of the Bin Laden family members as their clients. Henry Kissinger didn't want to publicly reveal his client list, but we knew that all of the commissioners were required to do so. After some polite conversation, I felt compelled to ask him directly if he had any Saudi clients or any clients by the name of Bin Laden. After I asked my questions, he spilled his coffee and nearly fell off the couch. We'll never know exactly why, but the next day Kissinger resigned. As we did our research, it became clear that all of the members that had been chosen for the commission had some conflict of interest. We fought along with the commissioners to get more money for the commission, to get an extension of time, to get access to important White House documents, and to get Condoleezza Rice to testify. We tried in vain to get them to fire their conflict-laden executive director, Philip Zelikow, and fought against allowing Bush and Cheney to testify together in a void with no transcript and no press. As executive staff director of the commission, Philip Zelikow really ran the show, deciding what topics would be covered at the hearings and who would be called to testify. After some cursory research, we found out that in 1995, he and Condoleezza Rice had co-authored a book called Germany Unified and Europe Transformed, a study in statecraft. They had worked together in the first Bush White House and had both been members of the second Bush's transition team in 2000-2001. As our intense monitoring of the 9-11 Commission continued, we found that there were even more insidious conflicts surrounding Dr. Zelikow. In his work for President Bush's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, the PFIAB, Zelikow helped write the plans for the Iraq War. The Family Steering Committee immediately put out a press release. Quote, it is apparent that Dr. Zelikow should never have been permitted to be executive staff director of the Commission. As executive staff director, his his job has been to steer the direction of the Commission's investigation, an investigation whose mandate includes understanding why the Bush administration failed to prioritize the al-Qaeda threat. It is abundantly clear that Zelikow's conflicts go beyond just the transition period. The press release went on to request Zelikow's resignation. The 9-11 families, or at least some of us, were hoping for a real investigation with scholars and experts in the appropriate fields and evidence to back up the work. We had wanted true independence from politics. We had fought so hard to get this commission and did not want someone who clearly had huge conflicts of interest to be running the investigation. But unfortunately, that's what we got. 10 years after the 9-11 attacks, the old questions still linger and new ones have arisen. A real investigation into 9-11 has never been done. This is incredible considering the direction that we have taken as a country. The passing of the Patriot Act, Entering two wars and our entire foreign policy has all been based on the official account of 9-11. The proper place for the 9-11 proceedings would be a courtroom with subpoena power, rules for swearing in witnesses, and established protocols for handling questioning, cross-examination, and evidence. And ultimately, one would hope, real accountability for the actions that led to the deaths of so many. I want to thank you all for taking the time to gather together on this 10th anniversary in order to explore the issues and continue asking the questions that have never been answered regarding the events of September 11, 2001. I define SCADs as concerted actions or inactions by government insiders intended to manipulate democratic processes and undermine popular sovereignty. All I did was looked at Iran-Contra, Watergate, Plamegate, 
the manipulation of intelligence to get us into the Iraq war. And I said, what would we call this? What should be the name of this phenomenon? And that's how I came up with this, this concept, state crimes against democracy. It tells us a lot that we didn't have a name for it. it used, these used to be called high crimes or treason. But that's, those terms have lost currency. Let's look at SCADs. I've got a list of 19 SCADs. These are political crimes and tragedies. Most are well documented. These SCADs, they're industrial level operations, 9-11. It fits the SCAD pattern. Uh, I'm just listing some SCAD characteristics. Intersection of presidential politics and foreign policy. Obviously, the 2000 election was, uh, had undercut the legitimacy of the Bush presidency, and that was turned around after 9-11. It furthered the, the war on terror. It involves military and intelligence skills with aviation and demolition. The crime scenes were investigated superficially uh, with the no check for explosives in, in the debris. There's something peculiar about this label, 9-11. If we look at 9-11, it's emotionally charged. It's connected to the emergency phone number, 911. I mean, that itself is very suspicious. And I think that that's the connection that if this was designed, was intended uh, to do, and it, that it may have been time to be on that date to have that connection. In this presentation, I will speak of anomalies in the 9-11 Commission report. By anomalies, I mean features about and in this report that would not be expected on the assumption that the official account of 9-11 is true and the Commission was a truth-seeking body. Conclusion. The points in the first part of this paper provide reasons to suspect the 9-11 Commission report to be untrustworthy. The points in the second part provide illustrations of the fact that this Zelikow report is indeed untrustworthy. Today I will discuss evidence related to the official investigations conducted by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, whose reports comprise the final official explanation for what happened at the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. Before we get to the reports, however, let me mention that the first pertinent point to consider is the low probability that the only three instances of a skyscraper suffering global collapse due to fire occurred all on the same day in the same place. There have been many raging building fires, much worse than existed in any of the World Trade Center buildings, but no global collapse has ever resulted from those fires. The U.S. government has told us that it was the fire that destroyed all three buildings at the World Trade Center. We can see from these photos that the towers appeared to have exploded, starting at the top and then going all the way down. Also, high-velocity bursts of debris shot out from 10 to 30 floors below the collapsed front. At the top of each tower, the debris appeared to shoot upward and outward as much of the solid structure turned to dust. This is counterintuitive to the idea that the building was being crushed downward. Some large steel column assemblies were shot outward for hundreds of feet. Many of us have asked ourselves, is this what it looks like when a building is softened or weakened from fire? Another serious problem is that NIST was stumped for years. Now, they told us in 2006 that uh, their lead investigator, Shyam Sunder, told New York Magazine that he didn't know he's had trouble getting a handle on Building 7. There's a problem here because the new Building 7, which is taller, built in the same site, was completed in 2006. You would think they would want to know what happened to the first one. There was substantial insider trading before 9-11. Insider trading is taking advantage of knowledge that you have privately, it's not public information, 
It's private information that you have about a forthcoming event and you engage in some kind of tra financial transaction which will uh, enable you to profit from that forthcoming event that other people don't know about. Sometimes insider trading is called informed trading. It's, uh, you see it both ways. For about one month after 9-11-2001, there was reports in mainstream uh, financial press of huge profits being made um, on the 9-11 event by foreknowledge of the events, okay? One of the key statements being made referred to using put options. A put option is in the so-called option markets, okay? You purchase, you don't actually purchase a stock, you don't sell a stock or anything like that you purchase an option to do something with a stock. You purchase the option for a specific period of time to be able to, in the case of a put option, to be able to put the stock for sale at a spe specified price in the, let's say the next six weeks. The option of selling these stocks, let's say, by any time before October 20th at the designated put price. American stock and United stock had almost the same price before 9-11, namely around $30. If you knew on September 3rd, 4th or whatever, that 9-11 was going to happen, you could go to a, to a financial firm and buy a option to sell United or American stock, let's say $30 anytime until October 20th. And you know, or you think you know, that the stock is gonna go down. When it comes to, let's say, September 16th or 18th or whatever, okay, you can decide to, to buy the stock if you don't already have it. You buy American Airlines in the same day, same hour, same second, you sell it. You're buying it at under $20 and you had that option to sell it at 30. You made $10. We have three econometric studies one of which was published five years ago, the second of which was published just a few months ago, and the third of which is not even submitted for publication, but uh, will be submitted very shortly. These are done by econometricians addressing the issue about whether there could be insider trading or informed trading before 9-11. The 9-11 Commission report says it did a careful investigation of what I've just been talking about, namely insider trading in put options on American Airlines and on United Airlines, okay? And it says for these two stocks before 9-11, we found no evidence of insider trading in spite of the fact that it seems to be uh, uh, suspicious. These papers are not contested to the best of my knowledge. Therefore, I accept this econometric research as meritorious. And that's what I'm, I'm recommending to the panel. You accept these econometric studies as meritorious. I represent 1,550 architects and engineers now calling for a new investigation of the destruction of these towers. Why? Because the evidence shows, and as I believe you'll see today, that these all three skyscrapers were destroyed by explosive controlled demolition. It's the hope of the 1,500 architects and engineers that I represent that these hearings prove quite successful toward getting all of us a new investigation. Thank you. What I'd like to address in my presentation are the broad consequences of 9-11 with regard to U.S. military doctrine, but more broadly, the pretext and justification which the lies surrounding 9-11 have given 
to waging a war of conquest under the banner of what we call the war on terrorism, or the global war on terrorism. And wherever the United States needed to intervene militarily, they used the pretext of Al-Qaeda in Yemen or Somalia or wherever, under different names, corroborated by media reports, etc. And in all cases, I can assure you, these are instruments of US intelligence, or MI6, uh, or, or Mossad. And there's a collaboration between them. What happened on September 11th from the standpoint of somebody who was in Washington, DC? We, as members of Congress, were given talking points. The talking points basically said that the United States was hit because we're free. Operation Northwoods, I called in James Bamford to explain to me Operation Northwoods. And there in my government's own writing is a most diabolical plan, eerily similar to what happened on September 11th. As you know, some of us think that the three buildings at the World Trade Center were brought down through a process of controlled demolition. So the question naturally arises, if that's the case, that seemingly outlandish thing, if that's the case, surely somebody on the scene would have noticed something, especially if this is in any sense a standard controlled demolition which uses explosives. Surely somebody would have heard them or seen them or felt them. And the answer, of course, is they did. And my job today is to give a brief overview of some of the eyewitness statements. Three points I want to make today. First, the conviction that the towers came down because of explosions, as opposed to structural failure, was common on 9-11. Secondly, there is substantial eyewitness evidence supporting this conviction. And third, this eyewitness evidence has been ignored or suppressed by the 9-11 Commission and the National Institute of Standards and Technology. The idea that these buildings came down because of explosions, and even, more specifically, because of explosives planted in the building, was an idea found all over the place on 9-11. On the scene, by eyewitnesses, even on television, on the radio, in the paper. Very common. And it's important that we know that. It changes our perspective on this. I will be submitting to the Toronto hearings statements from 156 eyewitnesses. So this will be an appendix to my presentation. It's 35 pages long because it includes the actual words of each of these people. This eyewitness evidence has been ignored or suppressed by the 9-11 Commission and the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And I can be fairly brief here because if we ask how many references there are to eyewitness statements about explosions in the towers in the 585 pages of the 9-11 Commission, we find that there is one sentence fragment. They are discussing firefighters who were in the North Tower when the South Tower came down, and this is what they say. Those firefighters not standing near windows facing south had no way of knowing that the South Tower had collapsed. Many surmised that a bomb had exploded. That's it, 585 pages. This implies that eyewitnesses who thought there were explosions were in the North Tower at the time the South Tower came down. In fact, most of them weren't. It also implies that they made a mistake. And they made that mistake because they had an impeded view. They weren't near a window. They couldn't see what was going on. This is grotesquely misleading. Many eyewitnesses were looking directly at the towers. So whether it's deliberate or not, this is a, an extremely inadequate and misleading way of dealing with this important testimony. If we ask about the National Institute of Standards and Technology now, which was given the specific job of figuring out why these buildings collapsed, how many references are there to eyewitnesses to explosions in the towers in the 295 pages of the final report? Zero. Not one. Now, you need to know that the 9-11 Commission and NIST had access to the same material that I have access to. 
It's not as if I have some mysterious sources here. And yet they both miss my 156 eyewitnesses to explosions, not to mention many other eyewitnesses that are not in my list. Whether that's deliberate suppression of evidence, which would be a crime, or whether it's simply massive incompetence, does not concern me today. Because either way, we have an investigation that is thoroughly inadequate, and that's why we need a new one. And I want to end with Gary Gates. I looked up and the building exploded. The whole top came off like a volcano. Gary Gates could, of course, be wrong, but if you ask me if 156 are wrong, I'm going to say no, I don't think so. Thank you. There is really no question. It's a classic demolition. All support has been removed and the building falls straight down. We've seen it many times, always and only as a result of demolition. NIST wants us to discount our perceptions and our common sense and believe only them. However, we cannot overlook the fact that the NIST report was produced by a government agency in an administration that was notorious for censoring scientific reports for political purposes. The claim that an event resembling controlled demolition was caused by office fires is patently absurd. The analysis leading to this conclusion was based on computer models while discounting contradictory physical evidence. The computer model has not been made public. The report has not been peer-reviewed. Before NIST even began its study, the crime scene had been destroyed. NIST refused to search for residue of explosives. As our colleague Frank Legg has put it, quote, the evidence for explosives in controlled demolition is, excuse me, of all three buildings is both compelling and obvious. Hence, the failure of NIST to consider this possibility is prima facie evidence of corruption. Amazingly, someone at NIST added a nice straight red regression line through their stage two data. They even gave the equation of the line it shows that the slope is exactly equal to the acceleration of gravity. So that red line is a flat out absolute admission of they're even closer to the acceleration of gravity than my measurement. They are right smack on the money. They're on that number for this accepted as acceleration of gravity. The red line on this graph means that NIST acknowledges WT7 came down without resistance and without doing any work for over 100 feet. It means all support for eight stories was suddenly removed by something other than the falling mass. It literally means that NIST final report confirms WTC7 had to have been a demolition. The only thing that's relevant here is the slope of the graph. And the fact that the slope, it doesn't matter how it started, how gradually it started, or anything else. If the slope of that graph is the acceleration of gravity, it's in free fall. And it doesn't matter what it did to get into free fall. It's in free fall. So everything else they're saying here is irrelevant. Free fall happened, and NIST admits it. At least someone at NIST agrees uh, with, the, with enough clout to put this into their final report and make it stick. NIST has no escape from free fall. The building as a whole entered free fall for a significant period of time over a significant distance. This requires the sudden removal of support, and that requires explosives. The NIST WTC7 report has never been peer reviewed. There has been no forum for critiquing or correcting the final report. This does not constitute science. It is instead an authoritarian declaration by a government agency that demonstrated repeatedly its unwillingness to consider the one hypothesis that could actually account for their observations. So how did the Twin Towers fall? It sounds like a very easy question, but in fact, it's kind of a tough question because if you ask almost anybody on the street, if you had asked me four years ago, I would have said, oh, I don't you know, the planes hit and 
and fires and I think I heard some about explosions, but I, that didn't happen, and, and, uh, and then they just fell down. But I really didn't understand how those towers fell. And I think if you ask the average person on the street that same question, they won't really clearly understand the official story of how those towers fell. But knowing how those towers fell is critical. September 12th, my local hometown paper carried a story from the Englewood Post, uh, from the, uh, I'm sorry, the Washington Post. And in it, they already knew what happened. Pretty amazing. We have the two largest structural failures in history, and they already had it solved. They knew what, the, they knew what caused it to come down. And we were told a different story. We were told the melting steel story. It says, in just under an hour, a raging fire from burning aviation gasoline softened or perhaps melted the steel. The experts already knew. The experts agreed that collapse of the two towers after the attack was almost inevitable, as if obviously they're going to fall down. And they give little diagrams in there as far as how they came down. Newsweek, extra edition. The intense fire caused the tower to collapse. It melted the structural steel. What the firemen might not have realized is that gushing jet fuel was melting the steel. As if firemen don't understand that steel frame structures, they routinely rush into them because they know they don't collapse. It's never happened before. But the Newsweek experts explained to us that the firemen probably didn't realize that. NOVA put together uh, a very nice documentary that I remember watching. The floors cascade down with a force too great to be withstood. The result is what's called a progressive collapse, as each floor pancakes down onto the one below. Now, what do we notice left standing? <laughs> they forgot to keep going, and there's something left standing. This is a strong core, 47 columns. They weren't just freestanding spaghettis. They were all interlaced and tied together. It was, in essence, a freestanding structure. So will global collapse ensue once started, and is collapse really inevitable? That's what they're telling us. Let's look at some real-world examples of other buildings that were intentionally weakened. In this, in this case, they were controlled demolitions. And they were weakened at the lower part of the structure, so it has even more mass to come down. Once they're weakened, will they automatically come down? Here's a, here's a uh, this is called a zip feed grain elevator. It was weakened, it didn't go down. It is not inevitable once you start something. Notice that it decelerates, it does not accelerate, it decelerates. Here's another one. We're blowing up the lower section, will it keep going? It decelerates, it slows down, it doesn't accelerate. It is not inevitable, necessarily. Here's another one. What do we observe? It is not inevitable. It's falling over, again, as Richard Gage would say, to its path of least resistance. So the statement that global collapse is inevitable, and all these experts are saying that, well, of course it's going to happen, is not backed up by our own observations. OK, what about thermite? What about thermite? Can thermitic material cut or melt steel? Can thermite make pressure pulses and or dust puffs? I guess it can. But why waste all that thermite and energy cutting the columns? Why not attack the weakest areas instead? Can thermite cut bolts? I guess it can. Can thermite be configured to cut just the bolt head? I guess it can. And without any evidence on the other side. Is it even possible that thermite could do this? I guess it is. I'm just saying what thermite can and cannot do. So again, remember the National Geographic experts and, and, the, and all the experts out there asked us this question. Can thermite of any type burn through steel beams? Using your power of observation, what do you think? <laughs> do you think it can, even though the experts said it could not be done? Here's another little quote out there. 
In these days, when a man who says a thing cannot be done is quite apt to be interrupted by some idiot doing it. <laughs> because we know that regardless of how beautiful their theory may appear, if it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. It's wrong. Today, I'm going to present evidence related to the existence of unusually high temperatures at the World Trade Center, both during the destruction of the three buildings and afterward for several months. Much of the evidence presented here will be taken from two peer-reviewed scientific papers. One of these papers is called Extremely High Temperatures During the World Trade Center Destruction. The authors include four PhD physicists, one PhD chemist, and several others, including myself. The second of the two papers I'll discuss is called Environmental Anomalies at the World Trade Center, Evidence for Energetic Materials. In conclusion, I think this is the evidence that needs to be considered. There are photographs and witness testimony of molten metal at the World Trade Center. This cannot be explained by the temperatures given by the official reports. There clearly were extremely high temperatures evidenced by metallic and other microspheres, evaporated metal and silicates in the World Trade Center dust. FEMA reported findings of eroded steel and sulfidation which have not been explained officially. NASA provided images of high surface temperatures, again not explained. Fires could not be put out at the World Trade Center site. There were unusual spikes in volatile organic chemical emissions, suggesting abrupt violent fires on specific dates, and unusual species in the environmental monitoring data also corresponding to specific dates, suggesting the presence of thermitic materials. There were high temperature problems noted by the University of California Davis team. And there are similarities, again, throughout all of this to products of thermate and nanothermite. These vehicles were burned as if something passing through the cloud was setting them on fire. And there were many witness testimonies to a hot wind and cloud. So thank you. Today, in my presentation, we will zoom in on the dust which uh, we have all seen several times in the presentations preceding this one. And in such huge quantities in what was called pyroclastic clouds, and the pyroclastic cloud is a dust cloud which is hot. There was plenty of dust. It influenced so many people in New York City, one of them being a woman who was living on the corner of Cedar Street and Liberty Street is this corner here. Her name was Janet McKinley, and she was allowed to come back to her apartment about a week later, and this is what it looked like. There was a thick layer of dust all over, and she had a cleaning job to do. She kept some of it for the purpose, eventually, of making it into a piece of art, because she also had an artistic mind. We put this, this dust into a plastic bag and apply a magnet onto it. And this is some of the stuff you can isolate from the dust by the means of the magnet. It was first presented to the world in 2007, on December 15th in Boston, by Stephen E. Jones. Following this uh, publication of Stephen E. Jones, I was asked to join this team of scientists investigating these red grade chips, and the work eventually ended up in a publication on April 3rd of 2009. The paper is based on four samples. Janet McKinley's sample is on the corner of the World Trade Center Square Plaza, and the other one here is from the Brooklyn Bridge. Sample number three and sample number four is a little north of that. In all four samples, we found these red-gray chips. These are the four samples, A, B, C, and D. When you heat these chips up, they react. In nanotechnology, you, d you start with composite materials, but you make the particles smaller and smaller and smaller. 
uh, and this is this is what happens to a thermite reaction. As you make the particles smaller, it it the time of reaction gets shorter and shorter, and then of course you deliver the energy to in a much shorter time, meaning that the effect gets much higher, and eventually you approach the delivery rate to that of molecular materials. The advantage of thermitic materials is that the energy content per volume is much, much higher than the unconventional materials, meaning that you can pack much more energy into a smaller volume than you can do with dynamite or TNT or RDX. Incendiaries, which act by means of heat, they must by necessity be thermitic. And this is what we have served, molten iron in the rubble, molten iron coming out of the south tower, and uh, these iron spheres being formed unambitiously indicating that thermite must have been there one way or the other. I begin with a question. Is the 9-11 Commission's new story about American 77 believable? One of the things that we would not have expected on the assumption that we have been told the truth about American 77 is that three years after 9-11, the original official story about this flight would be replaced with a radically different story. According to the original story, told in a press release of September 18, 2001, called NORAD's Response Times, NORAD was notified about American 77 at 9.24 that morning, roughly 14 minutes before the Pentagon was hit. This report raised a difficult question for the military. Why were the F-16s from Langley Air Force Base, about 130 miles away, not able to get to the Pentagon in time to prevent the attacks? In their 2006 book, the co-chairs of the 9-11 Commission, Thomas Kane and Lee Hamilton, wrote, if the military had had the amount of time they said they had, it was hard to figure out how they failed to shoot down the plane. The 9-11 Commission would avoid this conclusion by providing a new story, according to which the FAA had not told the military about American 77 at 9-24, in fact, the commission claimed it never did notify the military until the Pentagon had been struck. This new official story of 2004 by the 9-11 Commission got the military off the hook for not preventing the attack on the Pentagon. But this new story is not believable for many reasons. Turning now to United Flight 93. There were contradictory reports. In 2003, NORAD officials told the 9-11 Commission that the FAA reported a possible hijack of United Fl Flight 93 at 9:16. But the 9-11 Commission in 2004 called this incorrect, saying instead, by 10:03, when United 93 crashed in Pennsylvania, there had been no mention to the military of its hijacking. Conclusion. My report shows that there are many anomalous features in the official stories of Flight 77 and 93. Thank you very much for your kind attention. There's now a consensus, even from the staff of the 9-11 Commission, that there's something very wrong with the government story. 9-11 Commission team leader John Farmer has said there was either unprecedented administrative incompetence or organized mendacity on the part of key figures in Washington. In a sense, 9-11 was unprecedented, the greatest mass murder ever committed in one day on U.S. soil. In another sense, it represented a kind of event with which we have become only too familiar since the Kennedy assassination. I've called these events deep events, events with a predictable accompanying pattern of official cover-ups backed up by amazing media malfunction and dishonest best-selling books. 
Some of these deep events, like the Kennedy assassination and 9-11, should be considered structural deep events because of their permanent impact on history. It is striking that these two structural events, the Kennedy assassination and 9-11, should both have been swiftly followed by America's engagement in ill-considered wars. The reverse is also true. All of America's significant wars since Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, twice, once covertly and now overtly, and Iraq, have all been preceded by structural deep events. America, I argue in my latest book, has become dominated by a war machine in Washington, a war machine that has been building incrementally since Eisenhower warned us about it in 1961. I thank you very much. Of war and humanity and the utter madness of militarism, Dr. Martin Luther King had this to say more than 40 years ago about his responsibility to challenge his own government regarding its war on Vietnam. A time comes when silence is betrayal. That time has come for us. Even when pressed by the demands of inner truth, men do not easily assume the task of opposing their government's policy, especially in a time of war. And I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. I'm here to speak to you about the betrayal of truth that still continues today and to break the silence about events that present a profound challenge to our most closely guarded beliefs about government and democracy. The public's attention must be brought to bear upon the state crimes against democracy related to the events of September 11, 2001. These events collectively are referred to as state crimes against democracy or SCADs. State crimes against democracy are actions which are undertaken in direct violation of sworn oaths of office by officials in order to circumvent, exploit, undermine, or subvert laws, the constitutional order, or the public awareness essential to popular control of government. SCADs are dangerous to democracy because they are not isolated events, but a pattern of actions, or in some cases, inactions, which facilitate a progression towards closing down an open and free society into a police state run by a select few. Alternative explanations of political assassinations, terrorist attacks, and other national tragedies that differ from official state accounts are sometimes dismissed by the general public because they evoke strong cognitive dissonance, a psychological phenomenon which occurs when new ideas or information conflict with previously formed ideologies and accepted beliefs. In the use of repression and terror, including threats of censorship, suppression of information, imprisonment, and torture by leaders to silence political opponents and dissidents is not exclusive to authoritarian states. Such tactics can also be employed by leaders of democratic states, a fact that can be difficult for people to acknowledge, especially if it is not consistent with their belief system. We must be ever vigilant of the motives of leaders who would persuade us to surrender our property, liberty, and humanity one priceless piece at a time. How can we do this? First and foremost, by educating ourselves and our fellow citizens on how we, the people, can be manipulated by our government and its lapdog news media into forfeiting our civil liberties and duties. We need to challenge the long-standing and often erroneous assumptions about the role of government, public discourse, and dissent in democratic societies. And we can start by identifying some of the social, social psychological factors that can prevent people from examining evidence of crimes committed by the state. Although some people may harbor cynicism about bureaucrats and politicians, most do not want to believe that public officials in general, and especially those at the highest office, would participate in election tampering, assassinations, mass murder, or other high crimes, especially in democratic societies. For example, although public cynicism towards government was high in the months prior to 9-11, trust in U.S. officials in Washington rose significantly. It more than doubled to 64% in the weeks following the terrorist attacks, suggesting that heightened focus on national security breeds support for incumbent foreign policymakers. 
claims that state intelligence and other officials within democratic states could conspire with criminal elements to kill civ innocent civilians are difficult for citizens of those states to comprehend, even when backed by substantial evidence. Evidence that U.S. officials have used the attacks of 9-11 as a means to manipulate the mass public into accepting two major wars of aggression has been dangerously ignored by mainstream media and academia until recently. Protecting democracy demands that citizens must be made aware of how they can be manipulated by government and media into forfeiting their civic liberties and duties. Information vital to protecting citizens from crimes against democracy orchestrated by the state, as history has repeatedly demonstrated, can happen particularly in times of disaster, collective shock, and national threat. I got elected, several elections in fact, and I'll tell you very candidly how it works. I get money from special interest. I turn around and manipulate you, my constituency. And after you elect me, I look down at you and say, hell, I'm smarter than all of you. I just fooled you. I got elected. That is the way it works. That is the way it works. And so when people say, I can't believe that our leadership would be so criminal to, be, to, to cause 3,000 deaths my God, realize that that's what they're always doing. Ever since I've been in public office, the leadership of my country that I love, your country and the world, we've just been killing people wantonly. 9-11 generated three wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the most diabolical one of all, which will finance into infinity the military-industrial complex. And that's the war on terror. Hello, my name is Bob McElvain. My son Bobby, almost 10 years ago, died right here at the site of the North Tower. For years and years, I've been trying to find out what happened that day. I questioned the story of 9-11 immediately. I went to almost 90% of the 9-11 commission hearings. Well, my whole life changed after Condoleezza Rice uh, testified. And I, I don't call it testimony. As far as the case of uh, Condoleezza Rice, it was a filibuster. Uh, they were questioning her about this August 6th memo that Osama bin Laden was supposed to attack the United States. And of course, I assume everyone knows what a filibuster is, but she just talked nonsense. And each commissioner only had five minutes to speak up or to ask questions. Well, anyway, that ended. Nothing was said. Nothing was done. All the commissioners are Saran and Condoleezza Rice shaking her hands, everyone's smiling. And that's when I lost my cool. It was after that that I... I did an interview, I was angry, and I've been angry ever since. I realized the investigation was a total sham, and I think everyone in the world knows that the investigation was a total sham. Even the commissioners admit, that, some of the commissioners admit that it was a sham. So I've dedicated my life since then to just concentrating on 9-11 truth. You're having hearings up in Toronto. I, I just think it's such a wonderful thing because it's going to put this information out to hopefully the whole world. And from that, maybe we would have a nonpartisan objective investigation for a constant war. And it's based on what happened that day, what happened that morning. I just want you all to stay strong and do your thing. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.